Welcome to John McGivern's Main Streets, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of this popular TV program. I love it. <laughs> You'll hear from John, Main Streets producer and director Lois Maurer, and that episode's content producer as they share some of their favorite memories from filming and interesting stories that you won't find anywhere else. Today's episode, Woodstock, Illinois. Today we're talking about Woodstock, Illinois, which is our sixth episode of season two. Uh, we're back with Lance Miller, our content producer, and Lois Maurer, our executive producer and director. And Woodstock, Illinois, Lance, if people have never heard of that town, what, what is it known for? Woodstock is most famous for being the town where they shot the majority of the film Groundhog Day right. in 1991. <laughs> so you can watch the film and you can... Uh, visit the real sites. It's a big deal. It has completely changed their town. It's become a tourist destination. So originally the town didn't have their own Groundhog Day celebration, but after the movie, now they do have their own Groundhog Day celebration. People take walking tours. They have plaques in the ground and in walls, uh, in, in buildings, to tell people where the film was shot. People visit that town every single day. The, 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 the owner of the local bed and breakfast told us there are people standing outside her building every single day taking pictures and sometimes they just come in. And when we did the site survey, uh, that's where we, the site survey is before the episode, we go and get sort of the lay of the land of the town. We were in the bed and breakfast talking to the owner and two people just walked in and started asking questions and asked for a tour. The, the amount of tourism that's brought to that town uh, is absolutely incredible. And it's now an industry. It's an industry. And yeah. they've become known as being a great place to, for Hollywood to come film. So uh, they're always they're always filming commercials. And you so pitched there. this town. Yes. Because you the, the, you have a personal connection. And, you know, I don't know if you really want to talk <laughs> sure. about it, but you dated a woman in Woodstock That's for right. a while. Yeah. And, and you were afraid you were going to run into and her. And it's not the woman <laughs> you ended up marrying. Correct. No. And Luckily. she is still heartbroken, I hear. No, no. no. Maybe I just made that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. You were so excited So you knew the town Brown really Monday. well. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what happened was uh, after <laughs> we found out we were going to do the show and Lois started working at Plum Media, uh... Her third day here was the first day that I was, that we were in the office the same day, and I, and I sat her down and pitched it, and she said, well, unfortunately, Lance, we already have all the towns picked for season one. Right. So I was like, <laughs> so I sort of like nagged her for like a year. Oh, we got to do Woodstock. Oh, hey, I learned something else about Woodstock. And then, uh, so I was just so honored and happy when Lois announced that the, f the first show our first announcement was that we were going to be filming in Woodstock. <laughs> and so you guys went there for the um, for your site survey, and I ended up, so if you've watched the movie Groundhog Day, because as Lance said, it's really around, it's, it's all about Groundhog Day, this town is. And by the way, if you haven't watched it, any hotel that you stay in around Woodstock is going to have it on yeah. their system so you right. can watch it. You can. So Bill I Murray, stayed in the Bill, Bill Murray, Murray suite, mm -hmm. which is um, has the view out the window because when I um, walked into the suite, I thought, I I think they gave me the wrong room because <laughs> it's not true to the movie. Right. But it's right. the view is true to the movie. Right. So it's I think that they should call it the Bill Murray view suite. To you, sweet. That's a that really trips off the tongue, doesn't it? It's quite a house, though. It is. It is. It is quite a house. And when they shot the film, it was uh, it was just a private residence. They just sort of used that one view and the exterior of the house. Then somebody bought it, turned it into a bed and breakfast, and the person who bought it had no idea it was in the movie. Wow. And then people were showing up every day taking pictures, and then they like put up all these no trespassing signs, and then the current owner bought it and took all that stuff away, and she just lets people walk in the bed. And she's breakfast. embracing it. She's, she's loving give it. give anybody a tour. It's, it's, yeah. it's very, very cool. Yeah. It's a pretty little town, and can I tell you, Town Square is really the star. Oh, abs absolutely. That is the main street. It's got yeah. like, yeah, it's got four little main streets around this town square. It's, it's, right. It's, it's gorgeous in summer. Uh, a favorite, Lance? What was it? Oh, boy. Uh, I, I, I got to say it. Uh, the thing that I, I can't stop talking about <laughs> is Boss Straws. <laughs> Do you, do, do you no, I'm telling you, so it's terrific. Yeah, yes. so so here's the idea with the boss straws. So there's a big push to replace plastic straws with paper straws for a very good reason. But the problem is everybody who uses the paper straw hates them because they're terrible. They taste like paper. Mm -hmm. They get wet and gooey right away. Mm -hmm. 
This guy hated it so much, and he was a paper distributor, he decided, I'm going to figure out a solution. So he spent three years doing research and development. He figured out that the reason why paper straws are terrible is they just use the cheapest paper they can get away with. Yeah. So he traveled to all of his distributors in um, uh, Germany and Italy, and through three years of trial and error, he developed a paper straw that does not fall apart and does not taste like pulp in your mouth. You've used them. What do you think? First of all, they're so strong. Now, this is this is beyond cardstock. <laughs> yes. And they get wet and they don't dissolve. They don't, they, I mean, they're, they're great. I, we all have a box of them. Yes. Yeah. And That's on the box, of course, the paper says Main, John yeah. McGivern's Main Streets. I'm using one right now, as a matter of fact. It's, it's in a cup of I use them every day. I and will never go back. And you know, that business is owned by the kindest people. That's the other thing. It's the, not only is the product fantastic, but it couldn't be made by a nicer family. Family. We're the boss of straws. You're we the make boss the of straws. We make the best straw. So you said it's three types of paper? The three types of paper. And are there 15 types of paper in real life? Or how many, oh, how many types of paper? There's of millions papers. types of paper. So how do you reverse engineer that product to stand up to all the different drinks that are out there? My son Andy has done a tremendous amount of the testing. And with him doing that, we've come up with the best paper straw in the world. And you want to see it go. And when we were there, they had just announced to us that they had just sold into Disney. And they were going to be at all the resorts. And we thought, oh, my gosh, that's fantastic. Could not happen to nicer people. They had a pallet going out to Disney yeah. that day. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that I really like about working on the show is we often encounter these family businesses that are third, fourth, fifth generation yeah. businesses. The straw business, it was started by the dad. His son works there and his daughter uh, is like the bookkeeper, um, and the son is in the manufacturing. It's it's really a family. The affair dog there. was in the office. The, right. I mean, it was family. <laughs> yeah. Want to wear something that's going to support your favorite show? Shop at Main Street Store. Proceeds go to help us get next season into production. So come on, go shopping at MainStreets.tv. You know, I've got to talk about insurance. Are you stressed and overwhelmed with your Medicare Advantage plan options? It's ironic, really. The thing you need the most causes you stress. And it doesn't have to be that way. I chose Network Health because it's not stressful. For 40 years, they've provided health insurance to Medicare members throughout Wisconsin. And their customer service, oh, let me tell you something, it's like nothing I've ever experienced before. So if you're looking for a Medicare Advantage plan and you want to be relieved of stress, you got to call my friends at Network Health. Call 844-277-7174 today. That's 844-277-7174. Don't wait. I love, and it's so funny because I had never heard of it before, but then after we had done it, we saw another one right down the road, which they, there is a flower farm right. that you're able to go to and they give you, they give you scissors, they give you a basket and you go and cut your own flowers and then they'll help you make a bouquet or you can do it yourself. They'll, they'll sell you a vase or you don't need to buy the vase, but it's a flower farm that's full of how many varieties of flowers? A lot. I don't have the number in front of me, but it's it's a lot. And they whatever you cut down, they have to replant that night from their reserves. And it's it's a really cool couples activity, you know, because a, a lot of couples like to pick strawberries or raspberries and apples and stuff yeah. like that. Here you get to pick your own flowers. It's a novel concept, and there's not a whole lot of these places in, in the country. So we were lucky to be there. They're great. Another family, you know, family mom and dad family. showed me around, and then the two daughters were, uh, were you know, putting them together, putting yeah. the bouquets together. And I just remember that day was, I bet it was, well, it couldn't have been any cooler hot. than 150. <laughs> yeah. it, was it was so hot. <laughs> and of course, I'm in my, you know, I'm in my wingtip shoes and my long sleeve shirt. As oh, you always out are. on the flower farm. Yeah. And of course, we can't let you stay in the shade because that doesn't shoot well. So you have to be standing in the sun. And I don't sweat. 
And I felt bad for, yeah, you don't sweat, but everybody else does. So I felt yeah. so bad for the wife who was, you know, coming oh. around with the flowers and they're looking at me like they're melting and I'm like, oh. Yeah, so we it was, wanted to get done quickly and yeah. you're right, that day you were the only one not sweating. And we, we scheduled it later, <laughs> late in the day, hoping that it would be cooler, but that was not the case. Absolutely no, it was hotter. Not. <laughs> and a, another little behind the scenes thing, when you see the episode, uh, everybody who's shopping in the background, they're all friends and family of of the people who own the place. Right. So, so we had so many extras in the background. And it, I mean, that is really what the place looks like in the middle of the day. Uh, but I thought that was really cool that, that we were able to give the audience the full effect. And you have to have those extras there because, you know, we can tell them what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike the general public. And you guys were doing that. Like, Excuse me. Yeah. John hates being anywhere yeah. where he's in the way, where he thinks he's inconveniencing anyone. Yeah. And so at least when we have people that we know, yeah. you don't feel quite as awkward, do you? No. Okay, good. <laughs> if you could see him laughing. What else no. is this town known for? What do you remember? I was also very interested in ethereal confections. Now, one of the things that we do often on your show is find the local chocolatier, but this one was way different. How come? Because they make all their chocolate by hand. I mean, w like in the show, we, we see a lot of chocolatiers. They bring out a big brick of chocolate, and then we see what they make out of it, which is where the magic happens. Here, they make it from scratch, as in the owner's go to South America and find the beans. They have them fermented there and then they ship them up here and they do the whole process. They have to roast them, they have to crack the shells, they have to pulverize them, they have to add all the ingredients. They have to do this thing where they heat it up and cool it off, heat it up and cool it off, and that makes it really nice to bite into and gives it that, that chocolate, that shine. They make it from scratch. I've never seen any place that does that. And if I were to talk to a customer, what do you think your customer talks about? I think they like that it's all handmade, it's all, we make it from the beans. Yeah. So the beans come and you do everything after the beans show up. That's right. Yeah. So we start by doing roasting in-house and yeah. then grinding. Yeah. Downstairs is where we do all the chocolate production from the beans. Which they look like almonds, don't they? Yeah, so winnowing is cracking the beans open and separating the nib from the husk. It was good, and those w women were young and and yeah. you know had Passionate quite and, a, quite a business mm -hmm. and quite a bar downstairs. They're speakeasy. <laughs> yeah, that they were making chocolate in the right. day we were there instead of serving alcohol. It was, it really was nice. good. Yeah, yeah. but really the town good. is also known for typewriters. Oh, yeah. that's a, that was a fun stand-up. That was fun. No, all the whole little... the town, like they all, everybody has an old typewriter because it was it was the typewriter capital of somewhere. Yeah, right. In the 1920s. Uh, somewhere. How about the United States? <laughs> yes. Not of Europe. Well, actually, States. actually, the whole world. In 1922, by 1922, Woodstock, Illinois was making half the typewriters in the world, not just that's the country. Ama now that's the world. amazing. Yeah, it that is amazing. Is amazing. And uh, one thing that we didn't get to touch on in the show that I, I wish we would have had time for, but we just didn't have time to say it in an economic fashion, was just how important Woodstock typewriters were to the war effort in World War II. Mm. Because in a war, you need clear communications, can't have all this handwritten stuff. So the U.S. government was trying to buy as many typewriters as it could. They actually asked people to donate their typewriters to the war effort. So that factory uh, went from two shifts to three shifts for all the four years of the war, 24 hours a day, all the typewriters they made went to the war effort. They went to the army or they went to the government. And do you remember what was different about their typewriters and why they were so successful? Because you could, I believe you could see what you were typing. Yeah, like how could that have been an innovation? What did the typewriters before that look like? I guess you just couldn't see what you were, you were doing and you had to scroll it up and just hope it, hope it worked. Wow, it's a beautiful like town just to go take pictures in. The, the architecture is fantastic. It's clean, it's kept up well. So, you know, it's it shoots well, which is why, you know, right. I liked it. <laughs> and uh, the Opera House, did you love it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a beautiful yeah. place. That's a beautiful place. Being a, a film student, I've always been interested in the life of Orson Welles. And uh, Orson Welles moved a lot, around a lot when he was a kid, but he went to uh, school in Woodstock and that really sort of was where he really found his creativity and his theatrical nature. So he really considers Woodstock his hometown. So the first stage that Orson Welles performed in when he was a kid was the Woodstock Opera House. And even when he became popular and successful, he still came back to the town and, and performed there. 
Uh, and they have since named the the stage for him, which is it's, which is wonderful. And what a what a great little space. Yeah, and it, it's really funny. The reason why they call it an opera house is back around the time that it was built, the idea of building a theater it it, it got kind of a bad a bad reputation because of vaudeville As, cause, because of vaudeville and they yeah. thought ah we're not we don't want to have a bunch of vaudeville and boxing matches there right. right right so then they said well we'll call it an opera house well they've only done a handful of operas <laughs> there uh, but but back in the day they had plenty of vaudeville and boxing yeah you know <laughs> just didn't call it that and we loved it because it was kind of close to home yes we didn't have to travel around Chicago, you know, <laughs> and and it's nothing against Chicago, but traveling around Chicago gets to be, yeah. you know, there's a lot of construction going on this summer. And, and not only was it close to us, it was close together when we got there. So that makes a big difference yeah. in our schedule, being able to get all of our stuff within like a five block radius. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> it's nice and compact and small and it makes things easier on us. It's a great place to visit. People should, uh, people really should take a moment and oh, plan a visit to Woodstock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and if you're coming from the Milwaukee area or the Chicago area, it's yeah. only like an hour and a half drive. I mean, it's pretty easy, it's pretty easy to get to and it really is mm -hmm. worth the trip. It's worth a weekend. Loved Woodstock. You did a great job, Lance. Thank, Thank you, you so much. You're always pretty thorough. I mean, almost like to a fault, Lance. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, it's great. <laughs> it's great. We had a... Uh, we had a good time in um, Woodstock, Illinois. Now I know it. So thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lois. Bye, Thank guys. You. Curious to find out where John is traveling next? Head over to our website, MainStreets.tv, to learn more. Again, that's MainStreets.tv. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and please leave us a review. It helps more people discover great programming like Main Streets. Look for us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to follow all the action. John McGivern's Main Streets is produced by Plum Media in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. <laughs>